Okay, so I think it's about six now, so I think we're gonna go ahead and get started. Hi everyone, I'm Lena Rubin, Programming Associate here at Village Preservation. I'm so glad you're all here with us this evening. Quick bit about Village Preservation. We have been documenting, celebrating, and fighting for the preservation of Greenwich Village, the East Village, and NoHo since 1980. We work to expand and extend landmark and zoning protections and stop inappropriate development while also encouraging appropriate development in our neighborhoods. We host roughly 75 programs a year, all of which are now virtual and most of which are free and open to the public. Our events are meant to illuminate the cultural and architectural heritage, history and depth, and the value of preservation in our communities. So we are a nonprofit membership-based organization, so your involvement and support mean the world to us. You can learn more at our website, villagepreservation.org, and please consider becoming a member or making a donation if you're able at villagepreservation.org slash donate. So we call our home the village, but it is also the unceded traditional land of the Lenape and Munse peoples. I want to acknowledge um, in this archival recording that um, we would like to thank the Lenape and Munse communities, especially their elders, past and present, and express gratitude for their stewardship of this land, for contributing to its geography and for the use of their language as place names. Uh, if you'd like to find out more about this, please reach out and we would be glad to offer you resources. So just a bit of Zoom protocol. Please feel free to use the chat to say hi, tell us a bit uh, about where you're joining from or to raise any issues or thoughts. And if you have any questions specifically for our speakers who we will introduce soon, please use the Q&A function, um, which will help me to better keep track of your questions. Um, you can submit those questions at any point during the talk and we will get to as many as possible. So before I introduce our speakers, I would like to share a brief introductory video. My name is Jay Sherry, and I'm going to welcome you to my walking tour of Carl Jung's Greenwich Village. Here we are in Washington Square Park, the beating heart of the village ever since it opened in the early 19th century. It quickly became the city's most fashionable neighborhood and was featured in the novels of Henry James, who was born here. By the time Carl Jung visited in March 1913, its demographics had changed drastically. The Sixth Avenue elevator train had brought noise, cinders, and gloom to the neighborhood. The Patrician Wasp families had moved on up Fifth Avenue, making their way for Italian immigrants who were getting jobs in the local garment factories. The most famous, or more accurately, the most infamous of these was the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory on the park's east side, where a catastrophic fire two years before made headlines across the country and gave a big boost to union organizing. The other group of newcomers were recent college grads arriving from around the country, attracted by the cheap rents as they started careers in publishing, the arts, social work, and progressive education. Just a few doors up Fifth Avenue here was a cooperative apartment run by a changing cast of young radicals called the home the A Club. The name facetiously explained as referring to their anarchist sympathies. One of its tenants 
was Charlotte Teller, who came to Colorado by way of the University of Chicago. She was working as a freelance journalist and was introduced to Jung, whom she interviewed for the Sunday New York Times. With a second husband in tow, she moved on to Paris, where she frequented the Salon of Gertrude Stein, where she befriended the lonely young American artist Marston Hartley, who shared her interest in symbolism and mysticism. on McDougal Street on the south side of the park. The row of buildings behind me housed the institutions that helped these young intellectuals realize their goal of creating a beloved community. The Washington Square Bookshop was opened by the Boney Brothers, but actually functioned more like a reading room because its customers were living a hand-to-mouth existence. They congregated next door at Polly's restaurant where they could count on cheap meals and endless conversation. The most important institution for our story was the Liberal Club, which began as the city's leading reform club, some of whose members founded the ACLU, the NAACP, and the ASPCA. It was this group that invited Jung to lecture about dreams. The invitation was arranged by Beatrice Hinkle, who was becoming his most influential promoter in America. Her credentials continue to impress. She was a graduate of Cooper, now Stanford Medical School, and was appointed a San Francisco city physician, the first woman to be appointed to this position in America. She moved to New York where she joined the staff of Cornell Medical College and helped to open one of the first psychotherapy clinics in the country. After studying with Freud and Jung in Europe, she returned to New York and became a founding member of the New York Psychoanalytic Society. She translated Jung's libido book with the new title, Psychology of the Unconscious, and it became a bestseller. Psychoanalysis was all the rage among members of avant-garde society. This scandalous new method for exploring the unconscious aimed at alleviating sexual repression and appealed to those interested in free love and in liberalizing the state's divorce laws. Finally, their interest in amateur theatrics led them to start the Provincetown Playhouse, which introduced the works of Eugene O'Neill. He later wrote, quote, the book that interested me the most of all the Freudian school is Jung's psychology of the unconscious. If I have been influenced unconsciously, it must have been by this book more than any other. place, a cul-de-sac that looks the same today as when Jung attended a dinner party here as a celebrity guest. Number one here was the home of a group of women who belonged to the Heterodoxy Club, 
America's first feminist organization. Beatrice Hinkle was the founding member and functioned as a den mother to its younger generation. Besides doing individual analysis, she held what today would be called consciousness raising sessions with these vocal young women. They wanted more than the right to vote and they began to lobby for the Equal Rights Amendment. A limerick composed by one of their male friends captures her influence. We marched in a body to Hinkle. Young Sybil she were. She taught us so much about symbols and such that we learned about women from her. The dinner was remembered many years later this way, quote, Guests range from university professors and writers to distinguished labor administrators. Patchen still talked about a visit by the famous analyst Carl G. Jung. The atmosphere had been rather stiff and formal until Jung broke the ice by addressing a pet dog who was misbehaving with his leg. Come, come, be reasonable. I'm not a female. Before we cross 6th Avenue for our last stop, I would like to point out the building up at the southeast corner of 11th Street. It was the location of the old Grapevine Tavern, a popular watering hole where people stopped by for a drink and to exchange gossip. This gave rise to the popular expression, I heard it through the grapevine. on West 10th Street, across the site from the studio building, which was built in 1857 as the first building intended for artists. It made Greenwich Village the hub of the New York art scene for many years. In 1911, the young Lebanese-born artist Khalil Gibran, later the author of the perennial bestseller, The Prophet, moved in, paying $20 a month. What tour would be complete without at least one reference to the price of New York City real estate? Chevron was another of Hinkle's protégés and did a pencil portrait of Jung. This was not Jung's only exposure to the world of art during this visit. Hinkle, a neighbor of the realist artist Robert Henri, also took him to the famous armory show that was drawing huge crowds to the first exhibition of modern art in America. There Jung got to see Marcel Duchamp's controversial nude descending a staircase. This exposure stimulated Jung's creative side and played a role in the active imaginations that he began to record and illustrate in his Red Book after returning home to Zurich. Having recently ended his personal relationship with Freud, Jung's life was now heading in a whole new direction. With that, our tour is now concluded, and I want to thank you for coming along with me today. No, spontaneous. This is a moment. Okay, here we are seeing a, a fresco of some of the famous iconic artists who frequented uh, history in the 1960s. 
these things don't last forever. And good, I get to be part with my mask on. Yeah. She can be pointing at me. Hope everyone enjoyed that. Um, I just wanted to add that the Armory show was actually um, February 17th of, of 1913. So actually the, the anniversary was yesterday. Just wanted to point that out because I was excited. <laughs> so I will, without further ado, um, introduce our lovely speakers for the evening. <clears throat> Jay Sherry, PhD, has lectured internationally and written two books that locate Carl Jung in the context of 20th century cultural life. Uh, the, first, the first book is Carl Gustav Jung, Avant-Garde Conservative. The second is The Jungian Strand in Transatlantic Modernism, both published by Palgrave Macmillan. We will link to those books in the chat. His talk will highlight these events and the creative villagers who Jung encountered. His ideas about symbol making and the psyche resonated with a diverse group of intellectuals who were interested in progressive education, literature, and theater. Karen Carboner, president and founding member of the nonprofit organization, the Walt Whitman Initiative, is a Whitman scholar and teaches at New York University. A native New Yorker and award-winning cultural activist, she regularly leads literary walking tours for students and for the public. So with that, I would like to turn it over to tonight's speakers. Go ahead, whenever you're ready. Jay, you're muted. Oh, you're on mute. <laughs> one, only one glitch. So again, let me begin by saying welcome everybody. Thank you for coming tonight. Uh, to join Karen and I uh, in a dialogue about one of the most unique neighborhoods of our great city, New York, uh, Greenwich Village. Um, I'm coming at it through one rabbit hole that I went down in Jung's career, and I know Karen and I will dialogue about some of the residents that you know, like cross over time. So. Um, yeah, you, you know, Jay, I'm going to do anything I can to fit Walt Whitman into this discussion. Of course. <laughs> of course. Of course. But, Everybody but, will see Walt Whitman over Karen's shoulder there just to make sure we highlight the man. Uh, but, but firstly, I want to say thank you for inviting me. And I'm very much a student of this moment as well. Just, you know, I know that the clip was not as clear as we would like. I think some people had trouble hearing it, but it, it it's just magnificent, Jay, what you've done to kind of put together, I guess, what really was a footnote, right, in history, this 1913 visit of Jung to the village. And could we just start by asking you, because I, I actually don't know what got you here, like what made you focus on this? And I think some of the Q&A questions kind of go to that too. There, there's a question out there, why this part of Manhattan, right? Like why, what happened here? Yes, well, every scholar has a rabbit hole that she, he or she goes down. And of course, once you get to the bottom, horizons open up. Um, you know, Jung's career has been widely reviewed and studied biographies, histories of psychology, but in the Freud Jung letters, there was a passing reference to Jung visiting New York in 1913. And this is important, especially for the context that we'll explore, because over New Year's, just two months before, Jung had broken off his personal relationship with Freud. Mm -hmm. So just emotionally, it's very important to appreciate that moment. Uh, here he was, uh, what I like to say, he was at the top of the food chain, Swiss psychiatry, the crown prince of psychoanalysis, and yet with the theoretical and emotional differences with Freud, he had come to the end of that relationship. So, and the fact he was coming to New York, I knew was going to be kind of a like, where, where, where do you locate this in his career? And just over many, many years of research, 
uh, I slowly assembled all those pieces. And the critical one was the key role of Beatrice Hinkle. Mm. I'm happy you got to see twice because <laughs> uh, she is quite a phenomenon. She was his key promoter in the United States for many years. So she was the key link who invited him to come to the States to lecture to the liberal club. And why Greenwich Village? Because Beatrice was bringing Jung so-called downtown. Hmm. In 1912, he had spoken at Fordham University in a very traditional, professional conference setting and a very important visit. But that was the professional Jung. He visited clinics, hospitals. He was the talk of the town professionally. But then just, that was in, I believe it was November of 1912. So just six months later or seven months later it is, he's back, but in a very different way, emotionally, personally. So Beatrice is his link. She brings him downtown to this incredible circle that she has been bringing together. I called her, I dubbed her, she's the Greenwich Village den mother. <laughs> was Jung's contemporary in age, but, and she was doing analysis. I know the audio was a little difficult in a few places. She was basically doing consciousness raising groups with these young people, primarily the young women of the or heterodoxy club. So just so much was going on. We know the right to vote. And here is Beatrice being his chaperone to all these incredibly talented people of that cultural moment of pre-war New York. Wow, what, what an incredible meeting of minds. And I, I can't help thinking that the magic of the village is part of this. Right, and of course, as a proud NYU professor, and I know that there are some other proud NYU professors watching this, I saw some of the NYU flags on your video as a reminder of the university's presence right there. Um, and of course, NYU actually started downtown uh, near City Hall Park, but by 1835 had, I guess, also felt the magic of this particular place, right? And, and of course, I want to talk about Whitman because he felt it also much earlier, I guess, than you know, the period that we're talking about. But just before we leave NYU entirely behind, um, I know you mentioned that there was a lot of youthful energy around the circle, right? A lot of college graduates who were attracted to this. And I, I can't help thinking NYU must have been in the house. Oh, right with, with all of this is there is there like a tangible connection with this circle and nyu i haven't tracked it down there's yet one more research to do there's always one more thing to look up um but one of the things that i noticed karen was it sort of clicked from our conversation earlier today about the nyu place that the studio building just a couple of blocks away opened in 1857. So there have been all those young uh, Bohemian students who didn't want to follow daddy into law or business or banking, you know, as they explored their poetic side, their artistic side. Many might have been just amateur artists, but certainly of that Bohemian scene in the 1850s already. Name artists were already taking up residence in the studio building on West 10th. Mm. But certainly there were, because what's great is everything was minutes away. If right. we did this walking tour, it's all within five blocks of each other. And the Grapevine Tavern, the accessibility and the familiarity among all these people, the floating party, if you will, that Bohemians love to carry forward, you know, not just on the weekend, but continuously from, from apartment, mm -hmm. Provincetown Playhouse, you know, doing sets, just on and on and on. 
just because this was one of those famous cultural moments, um, I refer to it um, in one of my comments on uh, McDougal Street, a uh, book back from the 60s about this cultural moment, the creation of a beloved community. Mm -hmm. of Eros, that's right out of Walt Whitman, creating the social bonds, the erotic bonds, physical and social, that we're gonna liberate people to a new state of, of happiness and being. And certainly Walt was a pioneer. One thing I wasn't able to cover is one more place that Beatrice uh, had a role. She was the guiding spirit and the genius behind one of the great cultural journals of that war pre-war wartime called the Seven Arts. Seven Arts, right. That was a very short-lived journal though, right? But the cavalcade of names who first published there still boggles the mind. For example, Eugene O'Neill, who was an unknown young creative person, wrote his one and only short story that was there, among many other you know, poets, artists. It was just so remarkable. And Beatrice was the guiding spirit. You know, the story goes that she had a very wealthy female client who didn't know what to do with her money. <laughs> So Beatrice said, thinking of her young protégés looking for an outlet, she convinced the woman to sell her collection of Whistler paintings and fund the journal. <laughs> wow, wow. And you mean the collection of Whistler paintings funded only one year of that journal? <laughs> well, whatever they went for back in the day, but just that she was such a, a, a doer. She was such a catalyst. Amazing, amazing. You know, so, I the, you mentioned the seven arts, and the only reason that I know that, because I'm out of my uh, wheelhouse when we're entering the 20th century, but I do know that Horace Traubel, yes. who was uh, probably Whitman's most important supporter later in his life, who sat by Whitman's bed and wrote down every single word Walt said for like the last 15 or so years of Whitman's life. Trouble was also part of that seven art circle. Yes, he was. So Hinkle and Hinkle had kind of a direct connection with that legacy that Whitman kind of left behind. Right. And he would apparently stop by their offices, of course, sharing his reminiscences of Walt. So Walt was very much a poetic presence. Hmm. And um I think we see that also. Now I'm going to hold up something. It's going to be reversed. The famous <laughs> picture of Walt. But notice how Beatrice went from a Gibson girl to a new woman. That whole look, the relaxed collars that became Aragair. Wow. Think of all the photographs you've seen of George O'Keefe in those early years the white collars, the black, you know, all of those things. It's just so exciting to see the fashion being part of this total picture. Well, uh, with you mentioning that, I, I think, you know, just to put things in context and use my virtual background here, we are looking at uh, an image of Whitman, shirt collar open, right? This was Whitman's trademark. He was not dressed as everyone else was. He was really a trendsetter. And here he's sitting in a cellar bar called Pfaff's, P-F-A-F-F apostrophe S. He's actually talking to William Dean Howells, whose head is cut off, I think, in my version of this. Um, and this is, this is a much later depiction of, of Whitman at Pfaff's. This, I think, is from Harper's in the 1890s. But it's depicting Whitman in the mid to late 1850s. And you've already mentioned that kind of bohemian energy gathering yes. in the village at that time. And nowhere else did it gather so powerfully as Pfaff's cellar. Now, for those of you that are interested in preservation, that building still stands. Uh, in fact, I take students down there, you know, during the sort of before times of COVID to experience that space. Um, it's at 657 Broadway near the corner of Broadway and Bleecker. 
And uh, yeah, it was just a bar that welcomed all sorts of eccentric lives, you know, actors, um, cross-dressing actors like Charlotte Cushman, and then radical journalists, cartoonists, and of course, Whitman, who really never frequented any sort of bar ever in his life, but found some sort of community at Foss. So he would come from Brooklyn, and Jay, I know you share my passion for Whitman. He would, you know, if, if Whitman has passion for something, he does it, and he, he traveled six miles daily from Brooklyn during a time when we didn't have the subway, right? It took a long time from Brooklyn to get to um, the village and back. Uh, and part of the reason was because of this meeting of this, what we think is the first gay men's club, the Fred Gray Association, that met down in that bar. So Whitman found, I guess, the type of energy and camaraderie that you are talking about also in 1913 that Jung sort of walked in on and was so energized by. Um, you can't help thinking about the poetry of place here, right? That the village sort of has this incredible magnetism and energy to draw people from all walks um, and people who are experimenting. Um, so a question for you, I guess, you know, I often say to my students that Whitman's most radical poems, the Calamus poems of the 1860 edition of Leaves of Grass, the Calamus poems being um, these incredibly gorgeous homoerotic poems. Uh, that many, many people gravitate towards. I, I don't think they would have been possible without the village and without Fafs and without that community there. So question for you about Jung, did it rub off on him as well, this sort of electric energy that he found with the Bohemians in 1913? I think it did, but now I have to use the title I created for my first book. He was avant-garde, but there's a strong conservative streak. And I, I love that tension of the opposites, which is so central to Jung's identity and theories of, of the psyche. Um, because he was flirtatious, he was there alone. Some of the letters, you know, he loved this dinner party. But the things that's come to me slowly was not just sort of what he lectured about dreams, which they were all years for, but what did he get back from them? And this is a little more subtle. It's not just in the letters. You've got to read between the lines to what was the impact. The one that I can't elaborate on as much tonight, but the Armory Show. Beatrice lived in uh, Gramercy Park, just blocks away from the Armory. She took him to the show. And he, like so many people, had his first exposure to modern art. Oh. John was so famous, Picasso, Brancusi, and everybody else. It shook him up as it did everybody. And I would contend that that exposure stimulated his creative side because he was looking for a new direction after the break with Freud. He was willing to talk about the soul, you know, things that were not allowed in traditional psychiatry. That was taboo. Soul means theology. Soul means religion. Soul means poetry, OMG. But he had the courage to start in this post-Freudian stage of his life to include the soul. The wow. soul must have its place uh, in our lives. And that's not to say it's against science. Because what I love about the two men is how they crossed over from poetry to the science of their day. Now, Whitman was an older generation by several generations. And we all know his exposure to phrenology. What a dead end that was. But to give Walt his due, later in his life, he met and was, of course, the famous Canadian psychiatrist, uh, Buck, B.U.C. Maurice Buck, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think this wonderful relationship, because life is about relationships. How do relationships transform us? And Buck introduced 
wall to words like ego and the unconscious, which Absolutely. were not part of his vocabulary earlier on. So there's a bridge from Walt through Buck, I would contend to Jung, that here's this creative energy in us, libido, mm -hmm. from physiological sexuality through the infra, from the infrared to the ultraviolet spectrum, which is what Jung knew was part of things. You know, he was following William James more than Freud when he talked about the psychology of religious experience. He mm. didn't get away from it. That was becoming taboo, which is why Jung dropped out of sight. If Freud had visited, visited Greenwich Village, how many books and dissertations would have been written? <laughs> Jung visits, and it's just now coming into view. Because the old, the old cliche, the, the winners write the histories, and most histories, cultural histories of the village, of course, focus on the Freud, and I don't want to get into a Freud-Jung boxing match, but it is a fact. Right. You know, um, one, two, three, four, meeting the liberal club, meeting the heterodoxy members, going to the armory show, meeting those young artists before they were famous. And I can only imagine the impact they would have had in his own unconscious, stimulating his imagination, both in his creative work, which was to follow later that year, his famous Red Book, where he recorded his you know, deep, deep experience of the psyche. He records those and later illustrates them with his own gift for making art. Well, it seems by default then that the visit, you know, just in terms of chronology ties in with the Red Book. Yes. Uh, that's, that's phenomenal. And just to place the, the history for me, um, I know that Jung also read Whitman, right? Did that also happen as a result of going to the village? Well, it did, but in a roundabout way. Um, I'm in contact with Jung family and had the good fortune to have the family member check his volume of Leaves of Grass. Wow. Uh, that's amazing, Jay. That's an inside. How how does that happen? Wait, that you're you're passing that off as a footnote, but you've you've dug deeply into this, and you. So unfortunately, there were no annotations. <laughs> I was looking for all kinds of you know juicy footnotes and charts, but so what I realized this was the 1914 Kennerly edition of the Leaves of Grass. Jung was here in 1913. So my surmise is that this was a gift sent to him by one of his own, one of his young, maybe one of these young poets who met him. And I even suspect I have that person's name. His name was James Oppenheim. He was a client of Hinkle and the founding editor of Seven Arts. Oh my gosh, okay, and the circle is complete. There we so go. So he met Trouble, he knew Walt, he wrote his own poetry, was the lyrical, enthusiastic poetry popular among young Whitmanites, <laughs> you know. Uh, and what happens is many of these creative people like James Oppenheim, who's a footnote in our world today, but not totally. He was also politically active. Many of these were socialists and anarchists. He wrote the famous uh, labor hymn, uh, Bread and Roses. <laughs> and so quite a contribution now, you know, ever since then. So they were politically active, which Jung was not. I come back to the conservative side. You know, Jung being Swiss, and I know you brought, I'm circling back to your questions about sexuality and the bisexual, Hinkle was out there with wow. the people. And her theory making was based not just on what Jung was saying, but what, what was she getting in her clinical work with her 
heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual clients in the village. So, um, but Jung was again a man of his times, always a cliche but true. He loved that avant-garde scene, but he did go back to, and one could say, to say that he's a conservative Swiss is often said, well, that's redundant. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Um, you know, we all have a limit to how, and he was out there, but in that regard, Hegel was ahead of him in that regard. She well, let's, let's hear more about her. I know in a, in a few minutes, it's going to be turned over to questions, but yes. I, I want to sneak in a few of my own. And of course, I'm totally yes. intrigued with, with Hinkle, um, who seems to me kind of a predecessor to Edna St. Vincent Millay, you know, yes, a decade was. or so later, but very much an it girl right at the, at the center of things, but, but really changing. Uh, can, can you, I mean, was there any... Um, <sighs> Uh, like intrigue between the players that we're talking about here, you There's know, like with you visiting and leaving his wife behind, and I, I don't know. There's you, lots you, of you gossip. And yeah. gossip has always trailed Jung, you know. Um, uh, there's all kinds of stories. Mostly he was flirtatious <laughs> uh, because he spoke very colloquial English, like so many Swiss then and now, his English was probably better than most of ours. <laughs> um, he enjoyed America. He loved the energy. He visited frequently. Uh, this was his last trip before 1925. He'd already visited several times, mostly professionally. This was his first real cultural uh, intake, if you will, and he loved it. Um, so, and all of these young people, they were roommates, they were landlords and, you know, changing apartments. I, I could go on and on with the networking, who was in bed with whom, <laughs> who was divorcing whom. Somebody we didn't even talk about was Crystal Eastman, who would have been at that dinner. Crystal Eastman, the famous suffragette and women's rights fighter, she was the labor administrator that was referred to. She was at that dinner party with Jung that night at Patchen Place. And her, uh, her brother, Max, was one of the founding editors of the famous uh, journal, The Masses, which was more the political. So just these overlapping political, of course, liberation meant sexually, culturally, artistically, and politically. And Jung was, didn't take it all, all in for himself, you know, being Swiss politically was, and that came up later in a career we're not here to talk about tonight, later in the 1930s. But it's all just so explosively interesting. <laughs> Sounds like it needs a chart to be properly understood, right? Like one of those charts that shows the familial relationships. But Hinkle and Jung, was there any sort of magic between those two? That's, well, her, her, Sadly, I was in touch with her family for research, but sadly, they confirmed what I had heard at the Jung Library was she died in 1953, and uh, following the dictates of her will, all her private papers were destroyed. Wow. OMG, the loss. There would have been letters from Freud and Jung from the get-go, because she knew Freud. And... That's one of the things I like to say about Beatrice, maybe this will be uh, maybe a closing comment now we'll open it up, is one of the things I coined about Beatrice. Well, it was, why did she sort of drop out of sight if she was a founding member of the New York Psychoanalytic Society? She was blackballed by them after she aligned with Jung. So it was bad enough that she was a woman but the, she had the audacity to align herself with Jung, who had a more progressive idea of gender. And so she got blackballed. <laughs> so, and hopefully she is gonna return to a more honored place that she deserves. Wow, this is very exciting. Okay, well, I think, you know, rather than monopolize you, shall yes. we take a look at That's the Q&A? 
<laughs> let's invite let's invite Lena in to handle the Q and A. Thank you, Karen. Okay, Lena. Okay, thank you so much, both of you. Um, so let's take a look at our Q and A. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Francis Scanlon wants to know. Uh, Jung did seminal research relative to the intersection of astrology and psychoanalysis. Any village connection to that aspect of his work? She's also adding that Pulitzer Prize poet Louise Gluck references Jung as a significant influence on her poetic self-expression. Yes. So to take the first one, the astrology, Jung was so keen about every symbol system available to mankind. And this, again, is what he shares. There was a global perspective that was dawning with the Walt Whitman that was blooming by the turn of the 20th century. Um, Jung was keenly interested in astrology. Uh, there's certainly evidence that he knew charts, his own charts. His daughter, Gret, became an astrologer. And I had the honor to have my chart read by her when I was in Zurich. <laughs> so, wow. It's a family tradition uh, wow. in the Young family. But remember, it's to be understood psychologically. You know, it is not in physical stars moving mm -hmm. mm -hmm. over our heads, mm -hmm. it's locating them symbolically in our inter system. And he was committed to that. So the danger is, oh, and one of the great writers I would strongly recommend, who was strongly influenced by a Jungian psychological interpretation, is a, an astrologer genius, later, Dane Rudyard. So, um, so as far as Ruckheiser, I came across her name when I was the Library of Congress. And she was certainly in that circle. I think, and I, I don't want to claim too much, I think there was a connection to Hinkle, but there was a whole group of talented Jungian women that the Jungian scene was mostly carried on from Hinkle to another cohort of very talented, dedicated women who became the founding mothers of the local Jung Center. And one of them worked with Muriel uh, Ruckheiser. Oh my goodness. Wow. So many connections. Can we just have a shout out to Francie? Francie, hello, and thank you for coming. Jay, you're going to remember Francie because she's a many multi year participant in the Song of Myself Marathon. And Great. she's been at a lot of the um, initiative meetings for, for various Whitman causes. So, Francie, great to see you here too. Hey. Welcome. Selena? Okay, great. So I actually have a couple of questions about um, wanting to know more about the heterodoxy club. Um, so Richard wants to know if you could elaborate more on the impact that Jung's talk had to the heterodoxy club. And I yeah. think likewise how uh, the heterodoxy club influenced Jung's own ideas. Yeah. Uh, and again, I have to give a shout out because you know, every scholar stands on the shoulders of other great scholars. Um, you know, just so many, so much good work was done. Judith Schwartz did an important book about the Heterodoxy Club, uh, you know, back in the day. And uh, I, I relied on her research a lot. Uh, it was a group of women. I think it was mostly that older generation, the founding, they were po almost post-suffragette. That's a whole subdivision to get into. Their mothers were suffragettes. Of course, they wanted the right to vote, but they wanted to go beyond that. Um, so what happened was they started to coalesce with a whole group of women like Crystal Eastman. And the records are up uh, at Barnard. I should not say Barnard. Um, uh, Radcliffe has the Center for Women's Studies, I believe. It's an incredible resource to go through their memoirs, their letters to each other. This was a powerhouse of the founding mothers of the 20th century feminist movement. Mm -hmm. And 
So they met, I believe it was once a month into the 1940s. So it was an ongoing organization, mutual support. I, I honestly use the word consciousness raising sessions. Mm-hmm. Them to help each other through their careers, their relationships, motherhood, careers. I think we know the landscape. And they were there, they, they were there supporting each other for all those many, many years. You know, people came, people went. There were fights, arguments, lovers' quarrels. People moved out on each other, but they sustained that community for those decades, from the 1910s into the 19, early 1940s. A remarkable. Wow. Work. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> So I actually, uh, I had a question um, that, I, that I'm just bringing to the table. Um, so you mentioned that Carl Jung himself remained more of a political conservative. And, but in your book, I remember there was a moment when you were talking about um, Eugene V. Debs, uh, the socialist candidate for president who received uh, landmark 6% of the vote. And um, you, I think, tied that into, um, or you tied like that political climate into um, the increasing affection for Jung's ideas. So I'm just wondering if you could just um, kind of tease that out a little bit. Like, what about his ideas appealed to political radicals? I, the word I want to seize there is the progressive movement. Jung mm-hmm. very much saw him as a progressive, mm-hmm. self-identified. That psychiatry has baggage. You know, was one of the world's leading psychiatrists, mm-hmm. breaking work on schizophrenia mm-hmm. and so forth. So, and that was, there was a whole Swiss uh, reform movement in mm-hmm. psychiatry. They were the pioneers of modern psychiatry, the Swiss. Mm-hmm. It was right there. So, but when you get into anarchy, it made him a little bit nervous, <laughs> you know, later. I think as he, this is after the war, not in the period we're talking about. So just to clarify the time span, um, you know, he felt the word was culture. I guess I'm trying to find the right operative word here. He wanted to see culture move forward. Uh, You know, the world religions. And when it gets to political programs, he was a little skeptical about Bolshevism, mm-hmm. of course. And this was one of the fallouts that we can't talk about tonight. In the village, best friends were on opposite sides of the declaration of war. Mm-hmm. Some supported America's entry into the war, and they had friends who said, you sell out. Mm-hmm. I'll never talk to you again. And they did it. They took it seriously. So we're having that just that those what's called the confident years just before the war. Uh, there was Bergson's creative evolution in the year. There was, you know, hope about socialism, you know, common sense, rational social engineering, all of which was appealing. But then the war, the curtain dropped over America and the world mm-hmm. with the first war. Yeah. Because in the years to come, it's going to be the first war that gets the coverage, not the second, as horrible as it was. Someday, they'll be seen together as the 30 years wars. All kind of, someday, future students of history, we hope they're out there, someday we'll be studying some history. Because our differentiation will collapse in the future. Mm-hmm. And that's why we love the nuances that we're talking about and celebrating. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to remind people, I see that some folks are um, using the hand raise feature. Um, if you do have something to share, um, if you could just put that in the Q&A so that I can um, read out your question. Um, and I'd like to just say um, now is the time if anyone has any more questions, if you could please just um, put those in the q and I just wanted to pass along from the chat also, um, Carly Visser says that as a historian of the Heterodoxy Club, that she would recommend checking out 
Kate Wittenstein's PhD dissertation, The Heterodoxy Club and American Feminism, 1912 to 1930, um, on a sort of perspective of how psychoanalytic thought intersects with the, fe with the feminism of the and If I may, of course, let me, if I can, right on your coattails, Kate was a major uh, inspiration for me, so I want to shout out great. to you. Oh, great. Sorry. Okay, great. Well, thank you so much, Carly, for sharing that. That sounds like a great resource. Um, uh, let's see. Um, Jay, Jay wants to know if Jung's approach to psychiatry found more support in the U.S. than in Europe. That it did not. Initially, it did. And the, uh, you know, the work of several uh, scholars in Jung studies, Eugene Taylor and then Sonu Shandasani, have clearly shown Jung's psychiatric writings of this pre-war period were cutting edge, as I mentioned, his groundbreaking work on schizophrenia. But then what crept in was after his break with Freud and then into the 20s, the whole aura of he's gone a little bit soft. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, this poetry stuff or talk about the soul, religion was taboo mm -hmm. uh, in psychiatry, and God forbid, parapsychology. Oh my God, parapsychology. <laughs> <laughs> I'm wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on what parapsychology is, just in case people... Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> but Jung was always interested in borderline experiences. Uh -huh. yep. People don't appreciate Freud was not a psychiatrist. Jung was. Mm -hmm. And why is that important? Because clinically, Jung did marathon sessions with really, really disturbed people. Mm -hmm dissociated beyond. That's why he questioned a strictly sexual understanding of libido. It wasn't that he was squeamish about sex, but rather his clinical experience made him hesitant to put all the cards, <laughs> you might say, on the, you know, the, the uh, sexual explanation. Uh, and so what he talked about much later in a career, because his ideas of parapsychology evolved over his entire lifespan. Mm -hmm. And we're all familiar from Sting and the police with synchronicity. Now, he didn't coin that phrase until late in his career, but his experiences of all those phenomena, he was collecting them in his own lives, in the dreams of his patients, mm -hmm. cognitive dreams exist. Mm -hmm. You know, you can say, I don't believe in it. Well, it's not a matter of belief. They happen. So what do you do with them? Yep. Do you ignore them? Yes. Try to scientifically create a theory mm -hmm. that can contain them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that helps a little bit. Yes, that helps a lot. Um, Anne, Anne is also um, saying uh, that this, this was also the era of mediums and seances. Oh, he did his doctoral dissertation on his cousin's seances. So it was all- Really, did he? Yeah. Wow. He attended seances, but he wanted to understand them psychologically. This mm -hmm. is the key thing I've got to you know, point out as a mm -hmm. educator. Mm -hmm. It was not, what are ghosts? Mm -hmm. Our psychological phenomenon. Mm -hmm. They're he not white sheet floating. Yeah. Yes, I'm sorry, you. He thought so, that about UFOs I, as well, right? And he wrote a book about UFOs, Late His Life. Yeah. Yeah. So he was always open to things that are considered fringe, which yeah. has made him, as we know, popular with the New Age spectrum. <laughs> you know, he would have yeah. doubts about a lot of stuff because he said, don't take it literally. Mm -hmm. Consider it psychologically. What does yeah. it mean to you? your interior stuff. Um, Great. Thank you so much. Um, let's see. 
we have an anonymous question. Someone would like to know, of the four stops that you walked us through, which one is your favorite? I guess it's got to be Patchen Place. I just love the Heterodoxy Club. <laughs> and it is one of the most wonderful spots in Greenwich Village. You know, <laughs> anybody just walk Greenwich Village, get lost, because you're going to get lost. Throw the map away. <laughs> because the streets crisscross. They were originally cattle paths, Indian paths, and then Dutch cattle paths. So they crisscross in endless profusion. And cul de sacs, I think 4th Street crosses 12th Street somewhere, some crazy intersection. <laughs> the grid of New York started north of 14th Street. Grid. <laughs> Downtown, it's serpentine. <laughs> That's a great word for it. <laughs> um, I'm wondering if anyone has any more questions. Um, Karen, do you have any more questions? Or Jay, are there other things that you would like to add? Um, well, I have, I have a general remark on Jay's infectious enthusiasm and energy. I mean, that's what makes this so fun. Jay, thank you. Uh, you bring it to life with just your, your passionate energy. And I got, I'm going to get out there and get lost, man. Like after that, there's, I have no choice. <laughs> thank you. The next time we'll do this in person, all of us. <laughs> yes. That's okay. <laughs> And Thank we'll have so a, a toast at Fafs uh, at the end. <laughs> this is only water. <laughs> <laughs> Let the bubbly start pouring. Indeed. Absolutely. Thank, absolutely. You. thank you, Karen. Thank you, Lena. And thank you, attendees, one and all. Thank yes, you. thank you. Thank you, Lena and Ariel. And thank you, everybody tuning in. That was super fun. Jay, you are awesome. Thank you so much, thank everybody. You. Ariel, you, Karen. we'll be in touch soon. <laughs> So thank you. Okay. Good night. Thank, thank you so much, everyone, and have a wonderful night. Uh, the recording of this video will be up uh, on our website within the next day or so. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Thanks again. Thank you.